media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, recycling trade publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ted Dixon, CEO and co-founder of InkResearch.ca, Canada's first online financial news and research service, providing insider news and knowledge to investors. His website, CanadianInsider.com, home of the Canadian Insider Club. Welcome back to the show, Ted. Jim, thanks for having me back, and thanks for everyone uh, tuning in. Ted, in some past shows, we've talked about inflation versus deflation. What's your point of view now on deflation versus inflation? Well, based on the uh, guests we see on Inc. Ultra Money, which is our uh, video streaming on-demand service, and a lot of those videos are, are for free, by the way. On, you can get them on Canadian Insider. There seems to be two competing narratives. That's the, uh, a group in the market that believe, um, you know, this has just been a, a flash uh, in the pan in terms of inflation, and now that the bond market is signaling that a, a uh, Inflation, big recessions coming, and and we're going to go be going right back to where we were, say, in like 2012, 2013, and kind of those kind of lackluster years where commodities did very poorly, and the Fed was doing QE after QE. There's that, uh, you know, and and it, you know, there's too much debt, and that's going to crush everything, and there's not going to be very much growth, and so pretty much that kind of. Uh, gloomy D we call the economy scenario is going to come back with a vengeance according you know to that kind of thinking in the market then there's the inflation camp that these you know, things have changed and while uh, you know the the deflation crowd points to the bond market as signaling something mysterious going on that there's going to be a crisis somewhere or that uh you know just wait and see there's going to be a big crisis hit well i think the inflation camp says well no actually we already are at we already see that there's there's more than one crisis out there there's a war and uh there you know there's also this you know geopolitical supply chain uh disruption oh and there's this botched energy transition on the way to net zero 2050 have you noticed right and by the way the price of natural gas in europe was heading higher even before russia invaded ukraine and you know maybe the botched energy transition was just one factor that opened you know to help open the door for vladimir putin to gamble on his uh his move into the ukraine so I think the inflation camp are saying, oh, you know, yeah, maybe inflation's peaked, maybe it hasn't, but it's going to be a lot stronger than we saw last decade. So these are the two forces battling out. And, you know, I think at any given time, Jim, we're going to have uh, characteristics of both environments in the market, and that is why it is so hard for investors uh, this year and why it's probably going to continue to be a challenge particularly for investors who are used to using kind of ETF passive strategies, buying the QQQs, buying the the spies, you know, just buying and holding. I, I, I think that's going to be a very disappointing approach um, going forward. You know, a, an active strategy is, you know, uh, combined with some talent um, is, you know, the, the best hope for success in these uh in these kind of vo- very going to be volatile markets uh, in terms of, you know, not being able to maybe nail down exactly what trend is going to keep working for more than just a few weeks or maybe a few months. What are insiders doing? So insiders, let's talk about Canada and the U.S. Um, first, let's talk about the U.S. because uh, the story is a, a, bit, a, a bit shorter <laughs> there, actually. They're, they're basically suggesting that it's not too hot, not too cold. I don't mean Goldilocks. It's just it's, it's there's every the market's kind of fairly priced and and really if you're going to really want to find some opportunities, you got to do it at the stock 
the level. Like even in the financials, where we've seen probably the most, well, we have seen the most insider buying of any sectors in U.S. financials, it's a stock-by-stock difference. As we wrote in our market update on Wednesday for the U.S., you know, we had J.P. Morgan came out. They kind of threw the kitchen sink and talk, took credit losses, stopped their buybacks, threw a bunch of bad news, hit the whole sector because they're, you know, the biggest biggest banking player in the sector. And, uh, yeah, they... Uh, they they spooked the market, but on the same day, and we wrote about this, uh, a smaller regional bank. Not they're not they're not a small fry by any stretch. They came out and said, "Oh, everything's gr- basically, basically, uh, wow, everything's pretty good." You know, yeah, our credit losses have gone up a little bit, but that's because our loan book's gone up so much. Of course, we're going to have a few more credit losses. So, it was it was black and white between the two uh, earnings reports between those those two banks. So. I think in the U.S. it's it's going to be company specific. There's going to be management teams that are able to better deal with this changing uh, environment, with you know inflation maybe bobbing up and down, and uh, you know I think it's a much different environment than those that are anchored in the last decade that uh, you know maybe still haven't quite adapted to the realities of. You know what we're talking about—that there, you know, that there, there's been a, a switch in terms of geopolitics, supply chains, and of course you have the the, the societal impacts of COVID pandemic in terms of how that's changed consumer behavior. So there's a lot of changes that are going on, and some management teams are going to be better at adapting than others. And so, you know, it's earnings season. When you see some U.S. companies come out and go, "Oh, everything's terrible! Everything's terrible!" Well, why is it like? Is it really the economy, or is it maybe you guys have maybe made a few mistakes? So I think, I think uh, investors will have to really kind of uh, discern what's really going on at the company level in the United States, because you know we are seeing some good insider buying, but it's company specific, and certainly what we're seeing in the financials, the financial insiders who you think would know a few things or two are just not buying into this deflation bust narrative. They they just aren't, you know. So. I know there's a lot of gloom out there, you know, based off of insider signals. Uh, I, I just don't think we're going back to this sort of low inflation. Uh, you know, and we may not have great growth, but I, I just think we're going to be in a much different environment than we saw last decade. Canadian uh, insiders, uh, a bit different picture, you were saying? Well, the main couple of the, the Canadian market is uh, obviously more focused on the resource side, and they've been buying – this pullback, you know, the Canadian market was a, the first five months of the year. You couldn't be in a better developed market than Canada. The June energy sector gave a lot, a lot of the gains back, but we saw a lot of insiders uh, snap into buying mode towards the end of June when they could. You know, I think a lot of trading windows start to close in early July, so we're probably going to have to now wait and see on both sides of the border. You know how insiders respond in August, later in later mid to late August to two events but uh they they came in on in both the energy sector and in the mining sector basic materials and also forest products we've written a lot about the forest products area jim you know there's so much gloom about housing in there and at some point you know and i'm not saying we're there yet but at some point all the gloom gets baked into the into the price and we saw some good insider buying in the forest products area and now there's a st- there was a story out of uh, this week uh, by Reuters that uh, there was maybe some interest in taking one of the larger Canadian forest companies private you know well given the valuation levels that really doesn't surprise us the, the valuations are so depressed that you know so many people have bought into this over gloom and this this mega gloom a narrative that the housing's collapsing and, uh, in the U.S. and that, you know, that we're into this kind of disaster, this housing disaster. And, you know, this is, I don't know if this is just for, so people can get on, you know, these, these business television shows and, and, and get back and, and, and uh, get invited on and on again to, you know, uh, to spook people. But, uh, you know, we're just not seeing it, you know, in terms of what insiders are, are signaling in the, in, at the very, you know, primary level, uh, industry level and in, in the commodities level, you know, we're seeing a lot of optimism. Now you have to have more than a, a six to 12 month time horizon to take any comfort from that. If you're, if you can't take volatility, if you can't take 
well, if you can't take volatility, you know, this is going to be a tough market for anyone. Um, and, you know, as we saw in the bond market in the first, first six months of the year. So, you know, this is, this is going to be a tough market and it's commodities investors are used to tough markets. So I think in that sense, you know, people who have been playing the resource area for a few years, this may not be, you know, they may do better just psychologically than you know, uh, investors who may have only known sort of buy buy the fangs, watch them go up, and uh, hope that that trade comes back into play. I think there's a lot of that going on in the U.S., and you know, we're not seeing that from the insider activity. Yes, there has been some technology, isolated technology buying, but again, it's a stock by stock. Uh, situation. Some companies are going to do better than others. In the mining and oil and gas area, it's much more widespread. I would say the the insider activity. However, one has to uh, on the mining side be mindful of the major headwinds facing that industry. I think the oil and gas. It's a different. It's a different. Uh, a different situation. Different storm clouds. Um, um, but uh, yeah, in both both cases, then we'll be immune from from external events that, that shape returns uh, over the next year. But insiders basically are putting on, you know, putting on their windbreakers and uh, ready to, uh, you know, get a bit wet here and uh, face a few, uh, a few some nasty, nasty days. But, uh, you know, as we work through um, the ups and downs here going into 2023, you know, we're still, uh, we're still upbeat that, you uh, that the Canadian uh, stock story is not done. This was not a flash in the pan, and I think the deflationists who believe that this was just a one-time jump in inflation, they're going to have to adjust their expectations. We'll have more with Ted Dixon right after this. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Ted Dixon. Ted, some of the people I've talked to say they expect the price of oil could hit $300, $400 a barrel in the not-too-distant future because governments in Canada and the U.S. no longer support oil and gas <laughs> exploration. Uh, your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, that's all part of the botched energy transition. And the G7 as a group have done a horrible job managing this goal of getting to net zero by 2050. Now, whether you support that or not, the fact of the matter is governments have said that's what we're going to do. But, you know, they haven't done well, they did a terrible job preparing that strategy. So, and part of their strategy, of course, was, well, let's not promote fossil fuels. Okay, fair enough. Now, um, do we have enough mines coming on, on stream to, uh, so that like Ford Motor Company can sell 2 million EVs by 2030? Do, do, are there enough mines for that? Uh, has anybody asked that question? Uh, if they have, they haven't been talking about it publicly because there's no answer to that question. And there's been more than one study out there that has shown, that has said that, I know your question was about oil and gas, but just getting, I mean, the mining situation is just, it's just remarkable, right? That you're going to need to, to see mass, I heard, I heard someone today say that there was going to be, they needed more copper to be mined, um, basically over the next 10 years if we're going to meet our EV targets then you know has been been mined like for decades upon decades right like 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 the the math involved in getting the minerals out of the ground to do all the EV to, to build these EVs and to build the to build the, the power lines and the infrastructure is just not doable given the current regulatory framework, which of course, you know, these same bureaucrats, these same political leaders, um, you know, who are saying, oh, we gotta get to 2030, you know, we gotta be, we gotta be on the road to, to net zero by 2030 in stone. These are the same, same politicians who don't give a second thought to letting it take 20 years to permit a mine. Like, they, they haven't made that connection yet. And until they make that connection, I don't believe the EV transition is going to happen meaningfully. Yes, there will be, yes, uh, 
Ford will sell and, and Tesla will sell <laughs> EV cars, it's just not going to be enough to meet these aspirational goals uh, that politicians have been selling to the electorate that they can deliver. So we're going to have another crisis uh, in a few years uh, if this 2050 target remains in place because there won't be enough uh, materials to get us there. Now, in terms of oil and gas, look, you know, I think that's kind of like debating are we in a recession or are we not in a recession. You know, uh, the market's already priced in uh, a a downturn in the economy. And I think, you know, uh, in contrast, oil and gas stocks have not priced in a sustainable shortage of of energy. Uh, You know, if if they have done, if they would have done that, you would have seen much higher multiples on these oil and gas stocks. So I don't know where the price of oil is going to go to. Uh, I just believe right now there's still a massive amount of complacency in the market amongst, you know, uh, amongst investors in terms of how we're going to reach this, how we're going to fuel the economy over the next, next decade. Like there's just this, 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 this idea that, um, we're going to be able to ignore oil and gas because we're going to have more windmills and, and, uh, and EVs and solar. Well, I wish it, look, you know, I wish there were more EV and solar, but you know, it's not going to happen, uh, in the scale that's needed. So I don't know where the oil, price of oil is going to go. Maybe it's going to go down. There's a lot of people on Twitter saying oil's going down to 60, 30, 20. The last, you know, the, well, there was almost like a bidding war. How the price is right, kind of in reverse. How low can you go? And, you know, what Canadian insiders are saying is, you know, look, if we get this, if we get a massive oil sell-off, like, it's going to be short-lived. Like, you just have to live with it. This is the market we were talking about just earlier. You know, you're going you're to have these cross-currents of deflation and inflation. And deflationists, they will have their periods of, of you know, where they'll come out and do their victory laps and say, see, we told you, oil's going down. We told you, it's, you know, that was just a one-time thing. You know, we're, you're gonna, we're gonna have to go through that, and then, you know, oil will spike again, and the oil bulls will get out. See, we told you, <laughs> there's a shortage of oil. So this is going to go on, though, I'm afraid, for a long time. We're gonna be going back and forth, but I think the trend is gonna be, gonna be positive for the Canadian resource sector. It's just, it, you know, the trend is going to have a lot of volatility around it, and it's, it's not going to be an easy, Period. It's going to be easy to get shaken out. Uh, it's going to be easy, easy to get shaken out of your long positions, and shorts are going to, you know, uh, uh, on the on the other side, they're going to get shaken out as well. It's going to be Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Market are going to be are going to be having a lot of uh, a lot of fun with investors over the next few years, uh, just seeing how many they can, uh, you know, how many they can uh, shake off um, along the way here. As uh, I think, as I think, you know, we will. Uh, have a fairly constructive period over the next few years for Canadian oil and gas and, and mining stocks. It's just, you know, the, the, it's going to be quite an adventure, unfortunately, on the, on the way to that destination. Ted, anything else to uh, catch your eye that we should be keeping a, a close watch on? Well, you know, uh, we've covered the uh, the EV story, and uh, I really hope that uh, it that, that policymakers can... Uh, Focus their efforts on what really matters, and that would be, and that would be making meaningful choices on the regulatory front, Jim. You know, like uh, to put it bluntly, right? Like, are we trying to save the planet, or are we trying to uh, take care of every little local concern on the environment side? And you know, it would be nice if we could do both. But if you really believe, if these policymakers really believe we have this 2050 countdown. There's going to have to be some tough choices to be made by the regulators, and they're going to have to rework all. And that, like so, in, in Canada, that means at the provincial level, and that means the, the federal government's got to sit down with the provinces and say, "Look, we have to rework the regulatory framework so that when you're building a mine, if you're if, if these are critical metals that are needed for batteries to help us reduce." greenhouse gas emissions it means you get to speed up the process you get extra points whatever in terms of getting it through the process there has to be that kind of reform and it's a and you'll know it's happening when you have a lot of local environmentalist groups protesting against it right like until because that means tough choices are being made but right now we still have 
a federal government in Ottawa and a U.S. government, a U.S. administration that thinks that they can keep everybody kind of happy here, that they can keep local environmentalists happy and they can keep, they can keep the, the climate uh, movement happy. Well, no, I'm afraid that's not going to be possible if you believe we have a climate emergency. Now, if you believe we have two, three, four hundred years to fix the issue, well, then sure, we can take our time. But that's not what we've been hearing. Have you been hearing that, Jim? I've not. I've been hearing we have a climate emergency by 2050. So that's gonna. We're gonna have to see some tough choices. If we start seeing those tough choices, if we start seeing regulators making meaningful progress on the mining permitting front, and not just buzzwords and platitudes like streamline and oh we're going to streamline well that's nice that's a step in the right direction but you've got to make tough choices and that means that means you know there's no free lunch understanding that that there is going to be a cost if we're going to accelerate the mining in this country and in the G7 we're going to have to make some tough choices once we start seeing those tough choices you know coming then that may be a, a nice green light um, for a uh, uh, a sustained mega bull move in the mining area. Until then, we're just going to have to tough it out, and uh, you know, they, these metals and m- minerals will be needed. Um, it's just it's going to be a slog uh, to get them out of the ground. Still, I'm afraid, given the current mindset of regulators. Well, if oil hits three hundred, four hundred dollars a barrel, I predict we'll see a lot more horses on the road. Well, yeah, I mean, a good thing we'll see the horses because I don't think we're supposed to see any cows, right? The cows are 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 a danger to the to the to the climate. So uh, the horses might be okay, but I'm not so sure about the cows, Jim. So uh, we'll 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 watch for those uh, we'll watch for those horses. My guest has been Ted Dixon. Thank you so much, Ted. Well, it's a pleasure to be back, Jim. Ted's the CEO and co-founder of InkResearch.ca. His website CanadianInsider.com. You can find him on Twitter at Inc. Research. If you have any questions for Ted or any of our other guests, you can send them to info at HowStreet.com, our YouTube channel, Talk Digital Network. Find us on Twitter at HowStreet. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.